Over the past couple weeks, we have been really looking at the events around this guy named Balaam. And if you haven't been with us, uh, you can go back online, you can go to our website, you can go to our YouTube channel, you can watch previous messages there and, 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 and see things. You can go Facebook, I think, is the other place that, that has it and, and, and catch some of these things. But we've been looking at this guy named Balaam, and, and he was a diviner who was attempting to predict the future. And how he would do that was a lot of occult, witchcraft kind of things. He was, he was the seer, this diviner of these things. And he had a lot of abilities, but it was all based on a lot of the occult. And Balaam was somewhat of the celebrity of a guy. Like, People knew his name. People knew about him. People wanted to, to have him uh, come and, and say things and, and, and prophesy over stuff and, and, and do this. But the problem was, was Balaam was really out for Balaam. It was about him. And he knew about God, but it was really, I think, just an act. And last week, we looked at these, these things that I really think drove Balaam, as things like, like profit, like money, things like uh, uh, the, the prestige that you have, like this, this idea of, of who you are, the positions that we carry. The, the, someone else said, I think it was in our life group, that, that you know, the power, like, like those were the things that, that Balaam was truly after. And we see this as the story, as these events kind of unfold, that he gets there, and and he wanted it all. And I was thinking, man, sometimes we fall into that same trap, especially, I think, here in America. I think there's times that we fall into this idea about what's in it for me and what do I get out of it and, and how am I going to profit and how am I going to do this? And, and one of the ways that we fight that, that idea of profit, that idea of, of prestige, that idea of, of position is that we give we, we learn to be humble. We learn to serve. But there's even more to this story. Because Balaam struggled with something else. I think Balaam was a very stubborn, strong-willed person. I think Balaam was a, 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 a strong-willed, stubborn person. And God used some crazy things to get his attention the bottom line that I have for you today, what I want you to walk away from uh, today is this idea, this idea of what will it take for you to listen? What will it take for you to listen? And, and here's the thought, like, like here's, here's what I was thinking when I was, uh, I was doing this, and, and has anyone that have raised kids raised a strong-willed kid? Anyone have a strong-willed kid, right? Were any of you the strong-willed kid growing up? You can be honest. It's cool, right? Maybe a little stubborn, a little strong-willed, right? Usually your kid gets it from someone of the parents. Maybe you know that. I know myself. I can be strong-willed and a stubborn person. And this is a good time not to say amen. Um, I know that about myself. Like, like I'm a strong-willed person. And, 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 and it, I, I know that. I can look back over my life's of times when, when, when my strong willedness like prevented me for, from doing stuff or, or God really had to, to really grab my attention, move me. I knew at a young age, um, I say young, probably uh, middle school, high school age that I was supposed to be a pastor and I didn't want to be a pastor. Like, I'd always have this argument with God, like, I don't want to be a pastor. And he's like, yeah, you need to be a pastor. And I was like, I don't want to be a pastor. And we argued for years and years and years and years and years. I was raised as a, as a pastor's kid, and I knew what was in store for me. And I was like, I don't want to be a pastor. And so I, I, I do this. And I think God uses situations. So I know a lot of you know my story, but the year after high school, I decided to try to throw my life away and did a whole bunch of stuff I wasn't supposed to. I remember being outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, driving when I decided to put my car, which was a Pontiac Sunbird convertible. It was beautiful, man. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, under a semi truck. And, uh, <laughs> and God got my attention. And God got my attention and he said, you know, it's time to do something. It's time to, to go. It's time to, to do this. And I believe God used this situation to get my attention. Now, hear me on this. I'm not saying God caused me to wreck. I'm not saying that God caused this bad thing to happen to me so that he could get my attention. 
All I'm saying is the situation that was around me, God used to grab my attention because I know for myself I can be stubborn. I can be strong-willed. And I think if we start to look at different stories in our own lives, we might see how God has used similar situations to get a hold of our lives. When I got sick in 2019, I had to slow down some things in my life. I think God used a seven-day hospital stay to start to do that. And I can look back because of my life and see different ways that God has used them to help get my attention, to help, hear, or help me to hear him and to listen and to do this. I think we can see that somewhat in the story of Balaam. So let's recap, right? Balak, the king, Moab, sends for Balaam. He wants him to come and put a curse on the people that were moving into his territory. The only problem was is those people were God's chosen people. And so, you know, we, we've talked about this. Like, so Balak sends, sends people to get Balaam. Balaam's like, uh, I'll see what God says. But he's like, God said no, and sends them back. And then they come back again. And then finally he's like, all right, God's like, you can go. And so they start this journey. Remember, it was close to like 400 miles away. It took about 25 days on donkey. I don't know. Sometimes we complain about like a 10-hour car ride. 25 days on a donkey does not seem very fun. If you have your Bibles, though, we're going to actually get to the part that maybe some of you have been waiting for, where we get to a Shrek and donkey. <clears throat> not really Shrek. He's not in the Bible. But donkey, and, and if you have your Bibles, turn to Numbers chapter 22, verse 22. It says this, that, but God was, was very angry at Balaam. Was going, that Balaam was going. And the angel of the Lord took him, took his stand on the path to oppose him. Balaam was riding his donkey and his two servants were with him. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing on the path with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the path and went into the field. So Balaam hit her to return to the path. I want to stop here for a second. I was interesting because I was thinking about this and why was God so upset with Balaam? Because if you know, and if you've been with us and you read a chapter, a couple verses before that, when the guys came back to Balaam, he said, hey, stay the night, I'll acquire what the Lord wants. And the Lord comes to Balaam in the middle of the night and says, you know what, go ahead and go with him. But then the very next verse, when you read this, Balaam saddles his donkey the next morning and they take off for this journey. And the very next verse says, and God was very angry with Balaam. And I was thinking because God's not going to change his mind, right? Balaam's whole mission was to go curse some people. And those people he was there to curse were the Israelite people. They were God's chosen people. It was the people that God saved out of slavery, that God did all of these miracles for. It was God's people setting up to go to the promised land. And God wasn't going to change his mind and be like, you know what? Well, we'll go ahead and kill these people this time. You see, God wasn't going to do anything but bless these people. And he tells Balaam to go, but it says that man, God was upset. God wasn't going to do anything but bless the people. And I think Balaam knew this. So why was Balaam even going? Why was Balaam taking this 25-day journey on a donkey? Why was he even going to do something? And it says, the angel of the Lord was challenging the commitment of this prophet, this diviner, to fulfill the task that God had for him. You know, what's very interesting here is that the great seer, Balaam, couldn't see the angel of the Lord standing in front of him. Yet his donkey could. Plus, you need to understand something in culture right? Donkeys were a, a, 
a lowly animal. They, they, they didn't mean much. They, they, they were there. And, and you have to understand, and I mean no discredit to this, but you understand culture of what was going on. There was a hierarchy of males and females. Most females were pro- or property back in the day, like, like they would of people they would own and stuff like that. And the males dominated the society. They dominated culture. Still very popular in some of our Middle Eastern countries today. It's that way. That's the way it was. But the same kind of thing happened for animals. Male animals were prized possessions. They were, they were good. They were, they were what people sought out. So having a female donkey would have been even the lowest of the low of the low. And Balaam, the great seer, couldn't see what was right in front of him. But a little donkey could. See, there's things in Scripture I think we miss sometimes, and that little, that little word that says it, it gives you the, the, the gender of the donkey is important because it shows you its place. Let's keep reading, though. Verse 24, it says, Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow passageway between the vineyard with, stone, with the stone wall on either side. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord, pressed himself against the wall, squeezing Balaam's foot against it, so he hit her once again. The angel of the Lord went ahead of them, stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn to the right or to the left. And verse 27 says, and when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she crouched down under Balaam. So he began to furiously, he became furious and beat the donkey with his stick. Three times the donkey sees the angel of the Lord. And three times the donkey reacts to what he sees because there's this thing. I've said this before, and I know that, but I I think it's sometimes we we miss things. Like sometimes when we think of angels in the the Bible, we think of these cute little half-naked babies that are like little wings and are like flying around. You're like, oh, my goodness. No, these were warriors. These were were. Beings that were so powerful, so majestic, standing in front of you, that it would bring you to your knees if you saw them. And so this, this, this angel of the Lord was standing there with the sword drawn in front of that, and the donkey three times sees that, and he reacts until he couldn't do anything else but surrender. Think of it. First time he saw it, hey, you know what? I'm just going to hightail it off the path. We're going to go through the field. We're going to make a little detour. The angel goes in front of him again, and then there's a wall. So he had to like squeeze by hurting Balaam. And the next time, his path was blocked, and the only thing he could do was surrender. Balaam beats his donkey. And he beats his donkey for not submitting, which is very ironic in this story. Because that's exactly what the donkey was doing. Then things get interesting. In verse 28, it says, Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have beaten me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You made me look like a fool. And if I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you. But the donkey said, I am not the donkey. Am I not the donkey you have ridden all your life until today? Have I ever treated you this way before? No, he replied. And I know this one's not on your screen, but if you keep going in verse 31, it says, Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. The seer could finally see. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the path with, the draw, with his drawn sword in his hand. It's very interesting for us to know, sometimes we, we, we read these events, we read these things that happened in history, and we're like, it's kind of weird. If your cat started talking to you, things would get a little strange in your house, right? If your dog started telling you, it's time for me to go outside... Things would get a little strange. But something that's interesting about this culture in this time is that this is something, talking animals were very common in ancient literature. And it was very, this, this idea when they would tell fables and other kinds of things, they would, they would, would, would use animals that talked. 
And they would contain warnings or they would contain irony or they would contain uh, this, this different things that, that, would, that would help people learn. And so when you look at these events, one of the ways you can look at this is that there's this donkey's normal donkey behavior was heightened to such a degree that, that Balaam perceived this, interpret this as human manners. So maybe the donkey never ever said anything. Maybe it was just acting out in such a way that Balaam knew this donkey so well. It's kind of like this. When you have a, a car and you start driving your car and you're driving your car and then your car starts to act funny or starts to do something funny, you know something. Why? Because you've driven that car every day and you know when it's not performing. That's one way that people kind of look at the story. The other way is this, that God literally gave the donkey the power to speak. And the scripture here says, the Lord opened the donkey's mouth. So I ask this question in my head. What's harder, opening a mouth of an animal or getting a stubborn person to listen? The point is that God wanted Balaam's attention. God needed Balaam's attention, and he did. But it was only after God opened the eyes of Balaam that he see the Lord. It's interesting to me. He's having this conversation like it's normal with his donkey. Did anyone else catch that? It wasn't like... Really, like, like this donkey? I, I, if that's me, think about this. If that's you, and, and maybe you're cool, calm, and collective, but if our animal starts talking to us, if your car on the way home starts talking to you, you're not riding in kit. You're not, you're not a, a, this, this amazing person that drives around and saves people and drives into the back of a tractor trailer, right? You're not that person. So if your car starts talking to you, your first response is to have this conversation with them. So Balaam's like, like explaining and, and kind of going at like, why did you do this? And this donkey's talking back. And then it's not until God opened the eyes of Balaam. I wonder sometimes if God is trying so hard, so hard to get our attention. I wonder sometimes if God is trying so hard to just to get us to listen, to hear him, to see him. But our stubbornness, our strong willedness, we're so blind to all the things around us. Some of us have gone through the motions so much in our lives that it's even our Christian walk is more routine than it is anything else. So I started to think about this. How how do we how do we fix this? How do, we, how do we help ourselves be better, to hear God? How do we get our animals not to talk to us <laughs> and really hear the word of God? And so I have a few thoughts of some things that I think we can do that can kind of help us see the God that is standing right in front of us. You got it back up? Nope. Nope. We're having problems. Yeah, it's okay. We're having some problems with it, so you're just going to have to write it down as I say it. Here's the first thing you can write down. Seek daily. Seek daily. I was going to ask people to raise their hand for this question I was about to ask, and then I said, you know what? In my mind, I was like, don't raise your hand because I really don't want to know the answer to it. But I'm going to ask it anyway, so in your mind, think about this. But who gets up and brushes their teeth every single morning? Think, think, right? right? You don't have to raise your hand. Because if you don't raise your hand, I'm like, man, we need to really have a talk after service because that's kind of gross, right? But we get up every morning. It's something we do because it brings health to our life. It brings something that, is, that helps us uh, be able to communicate and talk with people without them like... Uh, not wanting to be that close to us. It's something that is good. We do that because it's something that's good. And it's become second nature to us. Like, it's just something you do. You have to teach kids to do this. Our friends have it written on a mirror that, that just check, like, brush your teeth, 
do a whole bunch of other things. That's in the morning routine. And all of us have these routines that we do in the morning that's there because that's what we do. We want healthy. We don't want to get cavities. And it doesn't mean we're not going to ever get a cavity or not ever going to go through something bad, but it means that we're trying to do whatever we can to prevent those things. We like the health. We like talking to others who practice the same practice every morning when you're in close contact. Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 through 34 says this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. There is something about seeking God first every day. Seeking God first every day. And it's something that's biblical. I remember growing up, I would have people tell me, like, oh, well, whenever you want to, like, throughout the day, like, like if you're not a morning person, which my entire life I haven't been a morning person, I, I don't do well in the morning, I don't communicate well in the morning, I've gotten better at it as life has gone on, but I'm just not, wasn't ever a big morning person. And people would be like, well, that's okay, don't see God then in the morning, just do it when it's kind of convenient for you. And honestly, I think that's a bunch of crap. I think God wants us to seek him first. The older I get, I don't agree with that statement because think back to when God was, was telling his people and providing for his people and giving bread to his people. They're, they're out in the middle of things. The first thing they had to do every morning was to get up and collect their manna. If they wanted to eat, if they wanted to survive, if they wanted what God's provision for that day was, they had to first thing seek God. When Jesus taught us to pray, Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, he says that to give us today our daily bread. So at some point, we realize that we need God more than we need our coffee in the morning. We need God more than we need to, to scroll through our Instagram feed or to scroll through our emails or to play the game. And I get it. I struggle with this too. I get up in the morning and I usually grab my phone and I, I, I start to do all of this stuff. And as I was preparing and doing this, God just kept telling me, how are you seeking me? Seek first, seek first, seek first. The emails will be there in 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Maybe you're not a morning person and it takes you a while to start to, to think. And I was thinking, like, like, but what can we do? How, how, do we, how do we seek God first? And maybe it's just a prayer in the morning. Maybe it's just a simple prayer that says, God, thanks for waking me up today. God, be with me as I walk through this day. God, you know I got this meeting today. You know I don't like this coworker. God, you know I struggle with this. Maybe as you're brushing your teeth and getting ready, it's the praise and worship music that's playing in the background. It's just putting those thoughts of God. Maybe it's asking God to, God, give me today what I need to get through. I think one of the ways that we can hear from God and listen to God, it starts with seeking him daily. Here's the second thing. In this one, you're probably going to fight most with me because it's probably one of the hardest, but it's called it's simply saying rest weekly. Rest weekly. This is probably one of the things that people push back the most on. But I ask, when is your Sabbath? When is your day of rest? When is the day of week that you rest. Yeah, I was thinking about this. It's important to God. Genesis chapter 2, right? So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. And on the seventh day, God had completed his work and had done that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work. 
that had been done. So God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. I know we feel guilty sometimes, disconnecting, sitting on a couch, not doing anything, but it doesn't have to be that. Actually, in Exodus, when they were given the, the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, it goes, God gives us a little more instruction. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days, do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to, to the Lord, your God. You must not do any work. You, your sons or daughters or your males or female servants, your livestock or resident aliens who are within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and earths and the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. This one's tough. Because our lives are so busy. Our works are stressful. I mean, I could be standing here preaching with you and my, my phone's dinging and my, my, my emails are going off and I still don't understand why people text me while I'm preaching. Like, they think they would know by now, but I hear every once in a while my watch ding. I get it. It's tough for me. Because you guys can use Sunday as a Sabbath, and you can come to church, and you can rest. I know for, for Susan and I, and Susan probably more than I, if you've ever seen her, she's like Energizer Bunny on Sundays running around here, beating the drum, keeping things going, making sure I'm in line. <clears throat> and so it's tough. And, and I get it because sometimes I'm not the person that likes to sit still. And I think what God is saying is that there has to be some day where we can disconnect from stuff that's going on and really connect to the things that are important. And maybe it is a Sunday for you. Maybe it's a Saturday. I try really hard on Fridays not to do a whole lot of things that have to do anything with church. I know we get caught up, but I think sometimes we're not hearing from God because we're not stopping long enough for God to be able to speak. And in our journey in life, we're just trying to plow through and get our donkey to go where we want it to go. And God's standing there saying, just stop. We seek first. Or excuse me, we seek daily. We rest weekly. And then this last one, and someone might debate this with me, and that's okay. I love to debate, so let's go. But uh, recharge yearly. I think there's something to be said to spending time every year to recharge. To put everything aside, truly recharge. Recharge. And I think some of us waste those times without even realizing it. I try really hard when we go away on vacation, the, the few times a year that we get to go away and, and do stuff, that I take my phone and, and I, I usually don't have it with me. I'll leave it in the room. I'll leave it somewhere where I can't be found. I like being on a cruise ship. One of the reasons I like being on a cruise ship is that I don't have Wi-Fi, I don't have a cell signal, and I don't have access to my emails, and so I am disconnected. But I know not everybody does that, and not everybody can do that. But I was thinking it has to be more than that, because how are we allowing even those times of rest, when we get away from jobs, when we get away from work, when we get away from stress, how are we allowing God to download and to recharge us? What are we reading? What are we doing? And sometimes we have these yearly getaways, these yearly things that we do a vacation, but we're either still on our phones or on our emails or on our computers or doing stuff that, that just really isn't recharging us. 
God would withdraw, Jesus would withdraw all the time to recharge, to spend time with God. And I'm not saying your family time's not precious. I'm not saying don't go on vacation. You need to go to a monastery somewhere in the mountains and spend your entire time praying. I'm not saying that. My point is this, is that our lives get so busy, our lives get so hectic. We have so many other things that bide for our time. Where is God in the midst of it? How are we seeking him daily? How are we resting with him weekly? How are we recharging with him yearly? You might think, what in the world does this have to do with Balaam? I don't read any of this. You see, Balaam was so stubborn. Balaam was so just thinking about himself. He was probably more excited that God said to go and forgot everything about the idea that God said, these are my people, I'm not going to curse them. And Balaam's stubbornness and his strong-willedness, he was blinded and couldn't even see God standing right in front of him. And so God used the situations around him to get his attention. I think there's a lot of times for us that God's using the situations to just get us to stop and to listen. A lot of us don't hear from God, truly hear from him. I think it starts by seeking him. When we do this, it moves us to taking those times of rest, those Sabbaths to spend time each week resting. We can look at our time away each year as times to recharge, to, to, to refill the tank, to continue to go. But it takes us listening. It takes us putting aside all this other stuff. For Balaam, it took his donkey <laughs> starting to talk and for his eyes to be opened. What will it take for you to hear God, to listen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time that we can spend together. I thank you for these moments that we can just dive into your words, to dive into these events that happened. And even as crazy as some of them sound, and whether we believe it or whether we don't believe it, God, we can learn from it. God, help us. Help us to see you. Help us to be able to listen. God, get our attention. God, help us to realize it starts when we start seeking you every morning. Let us seek you daily. Let us rest with you weekly. Let us recharge with you yearly. God, we need those times. We love you and we give you all the praise and honor and glory. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.